The so-called Golden Age of the Philippines is a topic of intense debate in historical circles. There are those who credit former presidents Ferdinand Marcos and Rodrigo Duterte for the upliftment of the Philippine economy, attributing it to their robust public expenditure on industrialization and infrastructure. Conversely, others argue that the true Golden Age was ushered in by the Liberal Party, Aquinos, under the leadership of Cory and Benigno Aquino. Their governance supposedly led the Philippines towards democracy, macroeconomic stability, and growth. Amidst these contrasting narratives, the question arises, who truly catalyzed the country's economic transformation? This question is best answered in a manner that acknowledges differing perspectives, yet it is also crucial to rely on economic indicators as they provide the most objective measure of a country's economic performance under a specific president. Among the array of presidents who have graced the Philippines' political stage, one figure remains conspicuously prominent. Ferdinand Marcos. He is seen by some as the Philippine savior, while others decry him as an unscrupulous, power-hungry tyrant. The economic situation during Marcos's tenure was not as rosy as it is often portrayed. The prevalent misconception is that the Philippines was one of Asia's wealthiest economies under his rule. But this notion is far from accurate. The peak of the Philippine economy was in the 1950s, well over a decade before Marcos assumed office. Marcos's economic strategy was heavily characterized by public spending. His ambitions were evident in his enthusiasm for infrastructure development and industrialization. Marcos implemented a flurry of projects and established numerous ministries that, to this day, continue to function as vital cogs in the Philippine government's machinery. Indeed, his achievements are most evident through his approach to government expenditure. According to the latest data from the World Bank, gross capital formation from 1981 to 1983, just before the financial crisis he triggered, was among the highest in the historical period until 2021. Gross capital formation, a key measure of societal progress, is the investment in capital goods like machinery, equipment, infrastructure, buildings, and other physical assets. These investments are critical for an economy's growth and industrialization. However, Marcos's presidency had a significant drawback, which could shed light on why his time in office is not considered the Philippines' golden age. A significant aspect of the economic strategy during Marcos's tenure was reliance on debt, particularly foreign debt. In 1975, the Philippines' external debt stood at approximately $4.1 billion. However, by 1982, this figure had skyrocketed to over $24.4 billion, a staggering increase within a relatively short period. This characteristic over-reliance on debt became a defining feature of Marcos's economic policy. By the mid-1980s, the burden of his debt led to the collapse of the Philippine economy, necessitating a bailout from global institutions and triggering a series of economic reforms when President Cory Aquino assumed office. While it may be unjust to attribute the collapse solely to Marcos's external debt accumulation, it certainly exposed the country's economic position to grave vulnerability. Furthermore, the global economy was contending with its own set of challenges, including oil shocks and Latin America's debt crisis, among other issues. Given these circumstances, it is difficult to claim that the Philippines experienced a golden age under Ferdinand Marcos. Even if we were to evaluate the years of economic growth under Marcos's rule, the performance was relatively weak. World Bank data reveals that the average GDP growth rate from 1982 to 1985, just before the economic collapse, was a mere 5%. This figure, which doesn't consider the subsequent crisis under Marcos, is quite modest, particularly when compared to the growth rates of Singapore and Malaysia under Lee Kuan Yew and Mahathir Mohamad, which were 8 and 6.2% respectively during their extended tenures. The discussion now shifts from Ferdinand Marcos to the Aquinas, specifically Presidents Corazon and Benigno Aquino. Under their leadership, the Philippines experienced moderate growth. Corazon Aquino, who assumed office in 1986 after Marcos' ousting, inherited a nation burdened with a colossal debt and a nationalized production sector. As a result, economic growth was limited during her tenure, and her administration is better remembered for its transformative effects. 
First and foremost, Corazon Aquino helped establish the new Philippine Constitution, which became a contentious issue for many. The Constitution transformed the Philippines into a protectionist state, restricting foreign investments and, as some analysts argue, favoring the wealthy. But despite these criticisms, the Constitution did bring about several benefits, including a mandated six-year term for sitting presidents, the prohibition of political dynasties, although not thoroughly addressed, and a more modern constitutional framework. Corazon Aquino's administration also oversaw the deregulation and privatization of the country's public corporations. This shift was driven by the need to finance the enormous national debt and as a condition of the bailouts from international institutions. Interestingly, President Marcos had sought a loan from the International Monetary Fund in 1985 but was denied due to his refusal to implement the necessary economic reforms that would have jeopardized the interests of his close associates. In summary, the Philippines under Corazon Aquino underwent significant change transitioning from the policies and laws of Marcos' regime to the Aquino era. Benigno Aquino was a standout figure in Philippine history. He inherited an economy recovering from the global financial crisis and is often credited as the architect of the golden age of the Philippines, transforming the nation from an ailing economy to a thriving tiger economy. His tenure was marked by impressive economic indicators. From 2010 to 2015, the gross domestic product grew at an annual average of 6.2%, the highest rate among all presidents since the 1950s. Unemployment rates fell from 8% at the start of his term to 6.1% upon his departure. Inflation remained stable, and overall government debt decreased. However, Benigno Aquino's conservative governance drew criticism. The current finance secretary and former central bank governor, Benjamin Diakno, who has served under several administrations over the years, has been particularly critical of Aquino. Diakno argues that Aquino's fiscal policy, which favored bucket surpluses and small deficits, was misguided. As a professor emeritus at the University of the Philippines, Diakno has expressed in his column for the university's policy analysis that Aquino should have invested more heavily in public infrastructure. This perspective leads us to the next potential golden era of the Philippines, as noted by Diakno. Average GDP spending on infrastructure was a mere 2.3% under Benigno Aquino, compared to over 5% under the Duterte administration. Undoubtedly, former President Rodrigo Duterte holds significant relevance in contemporary Philippine society. Despite being enveloped in numerous controversies, Duterte, a populist, reformist, and strongman, revolutionized various traditional policies in the Philippines during his tenure. However, Duterte inherited an economy riddled with substantial challenges. One of his significant contributions was lifting foreign investment limitations in critical sectors, causing analysts and investors to positively anticipate the future of the Philippines. Duterte's policy changes have set the stage for the current president, Bongbong Marcos, whose administration is attracting considerable investment. Duterte also overhauled the entire taxation system, earning him praise for many quarters. Furthermore, infrastructure spending surged under his leadership, leading some to dub it the golden age of infrastructure. World Bank data reveals that gross capital formation reached over 27% of GDP in 2018, nearly matching the peak during President Ferdinand Marcos's tenure, only to fall due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Nevertheless, Duterte's economic legacy is not without controversy. His administration faced widespread criticism for its human rights record and its handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. But despite high government spending, the response to the pandemic was perceived as weak, leading to a severe economic contraction of 9.5%, the worst in the region. Interpreting the legacy of these presidencies can be quite challenging, as we have not delved into the eras of other leaders who may also merit recognition for their initiatives. However, the quest should not be about pinpointing a historical golden age of the Philippines. Instead, it could be argued that the country has yet to experience its true golden age. 
this perspective often gets overlooked. While some may assert that the Philippines has had its golden eras under various presidents, macroeconomic indicators suggest no sustained period of economic growth to back these claims. Consequently, the country has been overtaken by several of its neighbors since the 1950s, a decade when it was among the wealthiest economies in Asia. Moreover, the issues constraining the Philippine economy are not confined to any specific presidency. Numerous studies since the country's independence have critiqued the failings of its overall democratic system. The influence of the United States has resulted in weak institutions and an unstable political climate. The country's geographical characteristics, frequently plagued by natural disasters and situated in a tropical region, also pose challenges. Nevertheless, despite the multitude of issues, the Filipino spirit remains buoyant. Numerous surveys over the years reflect this optimism. For example, a 2015 Gallup survey found that 66% of Filipinos were positive about finding a job, a figure higher than the United States' 51%. More recently, a recent 2022 survey by the social weather stations revealed that 46% of Filipinos were optimistic about improvements in their quality of life in the upcoming 12 months, with a mere 4% predicting a decline. Okay, optimism may not be a good indicator for economic success, however, such optimism is important in the era of the current administration, which may result in public support. Only time will tell, after all, what will happen in Bongbong Marcos's administration. But anyway, do let us know what you think. Thanks for watching.